Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EAB University Day. My name is Robin Osborne, along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University. We welcome you to today's presentation on an EAB Toolkit for 2015, featuring the best of EAB University resources by Dr. Sadoff. Cliff is an entomologist at Purdue who has been working on EAB pretty much since it was discovered in Indiana in 2004. He is one of the coordinators of EAB University and his expertise on everything EAB has helped many urban foresters, arborists, homeowners, municipal and governmental leaders and others in dealing with the pest. We're happy to have him bringing his expertise to us today. Before we get started, I wanted to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today. Please feel free to type them in the chat pod on the left of your screen. We will be, we will be making a note of them and Cliff will respond to your questions after the presentation so we can keep it running smoothly. Your feedback is also very important to us to keep these free webinars coming. So please stay tuned till the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. For those of you needing CEUs, either your survey information or an email to Amy Stone, whose email address is provided in the notes box on the bottom left of your screen, is necessary for us to process them. We can only give credit for this live session and not for the recorded version. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available after um, the webinar is over when you go to www.emeraldashbor.info, you will find the recording for this webinar and all our previous EAB University webinars there. So thank you for attending today and Cliff, here we go and it's all you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Great. we can hear okay. you. Okay, good. Okay, great. Well, it's uh, certainly nice to be here. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm happier about uh, being here or the fact that it's not snowing anymore and that uh, the ice is starting to melt. But I am uh, just want to just remind you all that the melting of the ice signals that it's time for us to actually get ready because uh, Emerald Ash Borer treatment time is uh, just around the corner. So today, uh, what I want to do is uh, combine uh, both a toolkit update as well as uh, giving you a, a bit of a sort of an annotated bibliography to tell you a little bit about the best uh, that we have had here on Emerald Ash Borer University. And my target audience today are people who have uh, been involved with Emerald Ash Borer for a while as well as newbies. So as you see in the front slide over here, there is a, uh, a button that says EAB On Demand. And you probably notice that when you get onto your uh, Emerald Ash Borer. Let's see, I advanced slides by, how do I, oh, OK. Got it, OK. So you'll see when you get onto Emerald Ash Borer University, uh, you can see uh, that uh, you can actually access a lot of the webinars uh, that have or, or already been, been given. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be highlighting a lot of information about uh, webinars that, uh, that were about new information, but I'll also be highlighting information that was also given in previous webinars. So, Emerald Ashbury University, to date, we have given 56 seminars to over 3,000 live participants, uh, which translated to over 30,000 downloads of these of these t seminars. So, uh, so, so we think that uh, this is a useful way, and I think apparently by the number of downloads, so do many of the people uh, who are have been attending. Uh, these people have come from lots of areas, everything from uh, uh, municipal offices uh, and master gardeners to arborists, uh, NGOs and homeowners and other uh, agencies and woodland owners. So uh, the first part I'm going to talk about is about review the basics of Emerald Ash Borer. And a lot of these uh, can be seen on the EAB On Demand. Uh, in more detail uh, with some of the, the webinars uh, done by Dan Herms, Deb McCulloch, uh, and Kath Kathleen Knight. Okay, so uh, Emerald Ash Borer uh, is uh, a, um, as you know, uh, the reason you're, you're on here is because you're concerned because it threatens 8 billion ash trees in North America. And uh, most of the native species 
uh, that are found in North America are susceptible, with the exception of blue ash, uh, but that is usually a minor component of the forest. There are some remnant white ash. Uh, that are surviving, uh, as was uh, discussed in, in some of the other previous research updates, uh, but they are a small proportion of the forest, and uh, the reason for that is an active, uh, are actually the subject of an active research uh, investigation. So, one of the things that is the scariest thing that I see about emerald ash borer is that uh, untreated trees simply can escape, especially in urban areas, and it happens very fast. This photo uh, by Dan Herms on the left, you see a street in Toledo, Ohio, that looks seemingly uh, healthy. Uh, these are all ash trees, and this is the same street in August of 2009. So you go from beautiful to dead. Cliff, um, you might want to check your audio again. I lost you there for a minute, so if you could get right, my audio. Check it back on. Yeah, okay. There you go. There I'm you back go. on. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when I left you, uh, was there a dead tree there, like this, or was it just? Okay, I'm not sure where I left off, but I'll I'll just start from here. Okay. So yeah, what happened? This is good. good. Okay, great. So what happens is that emerald ash borer, when emerald ash borer hits, it hits hard. It hits fast. Um, that you can go from having a perfectly green uh, tree-lined street in June in 2006 to the third three summers later having all the trees dead. And that is ugly, it's scary, uh, you know, these trees will have to be removed, but uh, the scariest part of it for me is that these trees are dangerous. They just don't stand for a long period of time, they fall off. Uh, when you have uh, co-dominant trees where we have basically two main trunks, sometimes these trees can split uh, and just drop without any warning. Uh, so these things are have to, have to be removed. And, and the removal process costs you know, quite, quite a bit of money. Now, how is it that these insects can kill the trees so fast? Well, they specialize by uh, feeding in the, uh, uh, in the phloem area. Okay, so if you look on the lower right of your screen, you see something that looks like a pie. And uh, on the outside, you'll see the bark. Uh, it's, it's actually a cross-section of a, of a trunk of a tree. The outside, of course, which is the bark. The in, inner layer is the f cambium and the phloem. And just beneath that is the sapwood. And ash trees are ring porous, which means they only have one single layer of active uh, sapwood that sucks the water from the roots and takes it up to the leaves. So as the emerald ash borer grows and gets bigger, as it feeds on the phloem, they start to etch the sapwood, and that compromises it, and it causes it to, uh, it, it basically kills it, and makes it difficult for the trees to bring up water. So essentially, they just, they just dry out and die. Uh, the emerald ash borer has got a one-year uh, life cycle, uh, you, uh, has one generation a year. Uh, right now, uh, they are about a half an inch beneath the bark in that little part that says October to April over here. And uh, you'll, you'll see uh, that they're waiting for the weather to warm uh, when they will go from a, a larvae to a pupa. And then from there, they will chew a hole in May around the time that black locust is blooming. They will come out of the, uh, out of the uh, trunk. They will then feed on uh, leaves. The females must feed on leaves in order to mature her eggs, and then they will mate, uh, and then they will lay eggs in July, and then the eggs will hatch directly through the, the eggshell into the trunk without crawling on the bark surface, and then they will start feeding on the phloem and causing the etching you see in the lower right-hand corner when they do all their damage. So what I think at this point is just for review is, is, is to help you uh, uh, review the signs and the symptoms. So these are the overview of what I'm going to cover, then I'll show you pictures of these in detail. Uh, what you see on the left is sort of a classic symptom of a tree. Uh, you'll notice a little thinning on the upper left. You'll know water, notice water sprouts on the bottom, and there's lots of other symptoms that I'm going to go over one, one at a time. 
uh, the thinning of the canopy occurs because the, the beetles tend to attack trees starting from the top, uh, which makes it difficult for us to get early warning signs. Uh, generally speaking, if you are uh, if you would be walking past a tree and you'll notice on the lower part of the trunk lots of D-shaped exit holes, it would probably look like the tree on the, on the right. Uh, basically, if you look up, the tree is probably completely dead. Okay. So uh, thinning is, 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 an earlier, is an early sign that you might see. Then um, another thing which I think is probably really common, especially at this time of year, is woodpecker activity. Uh, I was out in Indianapolis last night uh, giving a meeting and I was uh, talking, I wanted to sort of get a feel for what was going on and I was looking at ash trees and just looking for these flecks. So you see that orange arrow will point uh, uh, on the tree to places where the bark has been removed. And when you look close up on the left, you'll see that this was actually done by, by a woodpecker hole, by a woodpecker that, that, that came in there to pop out the, the larva and, or, or, or the beetle. And, uh, Okay, I'm back on. Great. So what happens is that uh, these woodpeckers will knock on the on the trunk, and when they feel they f they feel or hear a hollow sound, there's usually a nice squishy larvae or a nice uh, soft beetle in there, and they will pop it out and eat it. And we find this is I find it kind of annoying for myself when we're doing research on this because they're eating my data, but uh, they do eat quite a number of of, of, of beetles, and uh, they're. Uh, it's very easy to see this time of year. Uh, then another thing that happens is that you'll see uh, the zigzag gallery. This is this this typical winding gallery you see on the right uh, that gets bigger as the, as they uh, as they develop, and then uh, they will they'll move down inside, and you'll see a little D-shaped uh, emergence hole. Uh, another thing that happens, which is quite common, is this is this uh, symptom called. Uh, vertical splits. So what happens when, when trees grow uh, normally, every year they lay on new, new uh, xylem and new phloem, new tissue, and they, may, and they become wider. And the, the, the bark expands, the uh, tree expands, but, if you, but, but as the trees get thicker. But if you kill part of the bark, what's going to happen is that that part of the bark which is dead, which was killed by the borer, can't uh, lay down new tissue, which which would expand as the tree grows. So instead, it just pulls apart the trunk and it splits, and you get these vertical splits like you see on the right. And when you look carefully into that split, you'll actually see the zigzag gallery there as well. Uh, another sign that you can see is going to be uh, epicormic. Uh, another symptom you can see is epicormic sprouting. Uh, and this basically, uh, I, I often call these things water sprouts. Uh, you notice on the lower third of this tree, you'll notice lots of nice bright green sprouts. This is basically uh, what happens when the tree, when the re when the top of the tree, the rest of the tree is all dead. The tree is shooting out, desperately trying to grow and not die, and is shooting out as many sp sprouts as it possibly could so it can save itself. But uh, functionally, this tree is already dead. Now uh, another thing that we have, uh, 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 so 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 these slides which I showed you are actually part of a self-study program that we have here at Purdue uh, at eabindiana.info. We've got a uh, uh, sets two sets of slides, roughly about a hundred slides a piece, uh, that have got uh, come with it uh, a quiz with it. So if you have a clientele that are interested in uh, beefing up their knowledge uh, on their own, they can actually go through the, the self-study program and then after they complete a quiz, they can print out a slide, uh, a, a, a certificate, certificate that says that they have completed it and they know something a little bit more about emerald ash borer. Now, new, new developments, uh, well, uh, the uh, white uh, Fringe tree is, is, is now uh, known to be a new native host, and uh, only, uh, two, only uh, two weeks ago, uh, Don Cipollini of Wright State University uh, gave us an update on uh, this latest victim. So if you want more information about that and the details, I strongly suggest you take a look at his, at his webinar. Um, 
So you can see here this uh, fringe tree that's got the, the zigzag galleries and the D-shaped exit holes. All right, we've got some other tools that are available. Uh, uh, we have uh, apps that we developed at Purdue called the Purdue Tree Doctor. Uh, they work on uh, Android phones, they work on iPhones, and uh, you, they're available at uh, purdueplantdoctor.com. Basically what you do is you uh, open up the doctor on your, on your phone, uh, choose an ash tree, uh, look under, uh, look at the leaves, and you flip through till you find uh, symptoms. And the first symptom that comes out on uh, ash is going to be uh, emerald ash borer. So you so you see this tree which is functionally dead. And then you can get more information about it, uh, as well as uh, damage you, descriptions of damage and lots of pictures of, of of damage for damage and diagnosis. Look at the life stages, and then we have the latest control uh, uh, recommendations on there. Uh, the uh, more the more recent one actually has got um, the updated version actually has got uh, azadiractin on there now too. So uh, pesticide recommendations have been changing, and I want to bring your attention to uh, the second edition of the uh, insecticides uh, options for treating ash trees. This was updated in June of 2004, and it's different from the previous one. It looks a lot like it, other than the fact it says second edition on the top, um, and uh, it. Uh, it contains information about some new products, including azadiractin. Azid so these are the products that we can use to uh, protect uh, trees. Um, on the left, starting on the left, we have the neonicotinoids, which include imidacloprid and dinotefuran uh, that can be applied to the soil or as, as bark sprays. Then we have avermectin, uh, which is uh, emamectin, uh, 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 avermectins, uh, one called uh, emamectin benzoate, which is sold as triage as the, at, this, at this point in time, uh, which is injected. And then uh, the last but not least is we have uh, azadiractin, which is an uh, insect growth regulator. It's actually an extract of the neem tree. Uh, it's also OMRI approved, and I'd sort of like to say that if you have people who have trees which are still healthy and not showing any signs of injury, um, and uh, they're inclined towards organic products. Uh, this is this is a viable option. So, what is the toxicity of these different kinds of products? You know, because you know, you you want to know which. You know, this is important on deciding what to use when. And it turns out um, that all these products are not created equal. Um, let's start off by the looking on on the, on the uh, extreme left. All these products are either applied either as in injections or into the soil and they require the tree to be actively uptaking the product. So if there is a drought, like say for example in the drought of 2012, uh, if the trees, when, when we just didn't get any rain after June 1st, if the trees were not irrigated, uh, they would not be taking up this product into the leaves, through the, through the xylem, up into the leaves, they would not be killing beetles that are filling on the leaves, they would not be killing larvae that are, are feeding on, on, on the uh, phloem. So you want to make sure those trees are irrigated. Uh, so if we move uh, further to the right in, in, in the table there, you'll notice that all the products will kill the first instar uh, larvae. That means the neonate, so uh, soon after the egg hatches, the larvae will be killed by the first few bites of, of phloem. Okay, and then uh, imidacloprid is not very effective on the larger larvae, and the other products uh, kill later instar larvae, and we're not sure exactly how late they, they do, uh, but uh, we know that, that the dinotefuran, imamectin benzoate, and, and the azadiractin are all active against larval stages. Now, in terms of the adults, there, there seems to be a dramatic difference. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, once the leaves are infused with imidacloprid as a toxicant, what happens is that the beetle must feed for a, a while, a sustained for a, quite a pe bit long period of time before they start being killed. Uh, Dinotefuran, there are a few bites that they might have to have. Uh, Emamectin benzoate, one or two bites is enough to kill it. And uh, azadiractin is, is, is different in that the, the, uh, this product is not toxic to the beetles, but it will, will reduce the number of eggs that adult females can lay. So you can see the whole continuum over here. So I want to now review uh, some of the work that Dan Herms has, has talked about uh, in his seminars about uh, imidacloprid soil trenches. 
And I'm using this to show that we can actually protect trees up to 20 inches uh, dbh. Um, one of the things that I find when I talk to the public is that they generally do not know the difference between a circumference and a diameter. So to prevent embarrassment, I just tell them to stand in front of the tree and put one hand on one side of the trunk and the other hand on the other side of the trunk, and the distance between their hands would roughly approximate a, 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 a diameter. So uh, basically, he did some studies where he looked at uh, uh, several formulations of imidacloprid on relatively large trees in Toledo, uh, that same place where we saw that first uh, photo. And if you look on the left, uh, you'll see that the, the y-axis refers to a canopy decline. In 2006, all the trees were completely green. There, were no, there was no canopy decline. So all, five, all, all the treatments that were used, all, uh, had, uh, all the trees looked, looked perfectly well when, before they got started. In 2007, there was a little bit of accumulation of injury, but in 2008, uh, there was uh, the control, the untreated trees got to about 40% uh, decline. Uh, now, uh, all these products were applied annually, uh, either in the fall at a single rate or uh, the spring uh, at, at, at a, at a uh, or the fall or spring at, at a double rate. And what we find is that, you know, if you look at the white line, you notice that you go from uh, zero to 100% defoliation in four years, which pretty much echoes the slide uh, that we saw uh, uh, early on. Uh, interestingly, the when uh, imidacloprid is applied on these large trees uh, in the fall at the single rate, you find that the treatment pretty much fails. You have more than 50% canopy decline by the year 2010. And in 2010, uh, the effective treatments actually at one point have about close to 30% canopy decline, which is kind of scary. But you know, once the population declines, uh, once uh, uh, the all the untreated trees are all dead, the population of beetle declines, and the trees actually start to recover. So this is good evidence to suggest to uh, clients that they hang in there and continue to treat the trees, and then they will essentially uh, be uh, 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 be protected. Okay. Uh, so now uh, there are other ways that you can apply the insecticides. Uh, you can uh, safari. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Can also be applied as a trunk spray, as you see in the left-hand picture, uh, and, or it can be applied as a soil injection on the right with a Kyoritz soil injector. And uh, you'll see that this, this study uh, started in 2008 and was evaluated in uh, 2012. And they found with various, uh, with using various doses, low and high doses for the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> for the basal trunk spray, And the uh, soil injection uh, was quite effective uh, in comparison to the uh, untreated control uh, that had lost 50% of their canopy decline. Now, probably one of the more common ways of using uh, of tr protecting trees is uh, using uh, amamectin benzoate uh, or, or, or the, the triage product. And uh, there are actually, uh, you know, uh, Dan Herms did some work in 2006 where he looked at five different rates, uh, which are commonly called low, medium, medium, high, and high. And uh, it's the same deal started in 2006 on the left. You'll see uh, uh, no canopy decline in 2006, but he treated it only once, OK? So he treated it once in 2006. In 2007, all treatments are working quite well. In 2008, all treatments are working quite well. Even in 2009, some of the treatments are working quite well as well. So we know we have at least two years worth of control on trees 20 to 25 inches in diameter. Okay. So this is really uh, this is the reason why we know that we can actually use this product quite quite effectively. Now, which rate is the best to use? Uh, her, Dan shows that we can. Uh, protect trees up to 25 inches at the low, medium, and medium high rate. Uh, Dave Smitley did some work to show up to four-year control on trees 12 to 15 inches uh, with the low rate. And uh, studies are underway to determine if a medium rate uh, can be applied every three years to give the kinds of control. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the, uh, the triage label is that you've got lots of flexibility. You can use, uh, so on the upper, uh, so the, what you see in front of you is, is the actual label. And in red are the actual doses that 
correspond to the slide that I showed you before. And uh, so you can go anywhere from the, from the low, which is the two and a half mils, all the way up to the 20 mils. Functionally speaking, most people are using somewhere between uh, two and a half and uh, 10 mils, mils per inch. And um, you know, one of the things that we that we find right now is that there there's been some new work out uh, thanks to our, our colleague uh, Kathleen Knight in Ohio, who's been studying the rate at which trees decline in ash forests and the emerald ash borer population. So in this one site here, the green line referred to the percent of the stems that are four inches in diameter, okay, or uh, or greater that are alive. And in 2007, the green dot by the 100 suggests that all the ash trees are alive. And in 2008, two things happened. The trees declined from 90, from 10%, from 100% uh, alive to 90%, so there was a 10% loss. And then emerald ash borer traps were placed in the forest. At that point, there were 40 emerald ash borers per trap. In 2009, we went we went down to 75 percent to about 70 percent of the uh, live ash forest, and we went and the beetle population moved up to 120 okay per trap. In uh, 2010, when half the emerald when half the ash trees are dead, emerald ash borer population peaked at 160. Uh, beetles per trap. This is huge because this tells you this is when you have the most pressure, when there are virtually clouds of beetles flying around. In 2011, pop, when, when all, the lar all the significant ash trees are dead, the population of emerald ash borer just tanks. It's like 70, it's about 80 percent less or 75 percent less of what it once was and it continues to, to decline. It never hits zero but it continues to decline. So in terms of uh, uh, using doses, you know, early on when the trees are green and things are looking fine and there aren't very many uh, dead ash trees in the area, you could go ahead with a low rate on some of your trees. And then when uh, the, you start noticing uh, about you know, anywhere between uh, uh, 10 to 30 percent of your trees dying, you know, then you might want to go to a higher rate uh, to get a, a higher rate of protection. And then after all the ash trees are dead, you can then move back to a low rate uh, to keep your trees, uh, to keep your trees protected. So um, large. So so one of the the, the, the new thing, findings that are happening right now is we now know that uh, we can protect uh, lar large trees. Um, uh, some anecdotal evidence, some work that Dan Herms has done, uh, has shown some very large trees being detected. Uh, arbors are reporting for some success, and we're, we're starting some studies right now. This is a study we started in in uh, Lafayette, and you can see on the left uh, the size of the trees that we're working with. These are are are, are quite substantial. Uh, some of the trees on the right, they were they were they were dying before we started the study, but you know we're there's a lot of ash uh, borer pressure right here right now. We're seeing if in fact we can keep these these trees alive. Uh, this is really important to know that you can actually protect these trees because I was uh, in Iowa a few weeks ago talking to some folks and they said that, that that they decided that they did not that they did not want to treat their ash trees because they thought that you couldn't protect large trees and that protecting the trees would just let them grow larger until they would die eventually uh, because they could no longer be protected, and then it would cost more to remove them. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you understand that there really is no limit to the size of a tree that we can protect. So uh, uh, protection really seems to be a, a good option for, for for the long term. Now, what does this mean in terms of of, of control needs? So one of the things that, that I've done is uh, I, I've worked with some colleagues to develop this. Uh, tool called the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator. And what it does is it, it's based on uh, an invasion wave model that assumes that the number of trees that die double every year. And you can see uh, uh, on this graph over here that darker line of diamonds uh, are the number of trees that, that, that are dying. The, uh, the lighter gray 
uh, and this occurs over an eight-year period. The lighter gray is just the, the percentage of the maximum abundance of emerald ash borer, which suggests, just like the, sh the slide I showed you with uh, Kathleen Knight, uh, that the peak pressure occurs uh, the year before you hit 100%, okay? And then afterwards, the populations decline. Um, then uh, what, uh, what happens is, uh, so uh, in the early part of time, during the cusp and the, and, and the crest phase, uh, uh, you want to have a very uh, aggressive um, uh, management uh, policy where you're trying to pump as much insecticide in there as possible. And then afterwards, in the post, what I call the post crest, but other folks uh, would call the core to refer to the fact that you're inside the core of the emerald ash borer infestation, you could go into a more of a maintenance mode. And the reasoning goes like this, is that, you know, the tools we have to protect ash trees are quite effective at protecting trees with small amounts of damage. So you could actually go in there and um, you could uh, wait until you start noticing symptoms arising again, treat once, and then correct the problem. And uh, uh, I just want, want, want to uh, tell you that, that, that these curves are fairly well justified uh, with data. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, Chad Tingle gave, gave a nice talk about what was going on in Fort Wayne. And uh, what, what he found... Uh, he actually re reported uh, some of the uh, uh, the actual costs that were uh, the number of dead ash trees that were being removed over time. And what he found was that you know it was detected in 2006, and in the first four years they lost very few trees, and they could keep up with the actual removals on their own. But in the last four trees, they lost 80 percent. Last four years, they lost 80 percent of the of, of their trees, and it completely blew their budget. Okay, so basically, you know, as he says, you know, you, you, you just can't keep up with it. All right. Now, one of the things that I, I, I've done with the emerald ash borer cost calculator is I, I developed this, this web-based tool that allows you to uh, uh, compare the costs of different management strategies. And this is a, a, a fictitious forest of 1,600 ash trees. And I use uh, real costs for uh, removal and, uh, uh, and stump grinding based on Indianapolis prices. And I'm using uh, the costs uh, that uh, Fort Wayne paid uh, in their bid uh, to um, protect 1,000 trees every, every two years at $4.35 an inch. And I'm comparing three strategies. Replace the unsafe ash, replace all the ash, and then treat the best 80%. And the reason I do this is that I'm assuming that in most forests, uh, about 20% of the trees probably have to come down for some other reason. So when I compare these costs in the calculator, uh, where you see uh, that the top graph are the annual costs over time, and the uh, uh, x-axis on all these things are, are time in terms of years. And you see that in the first four years, if you look at the black line, as you, if, if you're replacing trees as they die, the population of trees that die just increases rather slowly. Then after year four, it really greatly accelerates. And as just like with the, the, uh, with the real data provided by uh, Chad Tinkle, about 80% of the costs you know, are incurred in the last four years. And you can see that's a, you know, that's a huge budget-busting situation. Well over $400,000 a year are being spent in a number of, of years. You could modulate that cost by proactively replacing all your trees and keeping it around $160,000 a year as you're removing them. But if you are treating your trees every other year, you'll notice that at no time do you actually approach that proactive cost. And then uh, after year eight, when you start elongating, you start, uh, you start increasing the interval between treatments, you start having less and less costs over time. And what happens is that if you look at the cumulative cost, which is the sum of cost of year one plus year two plus year three, and so on, you find that after 25 years, the cost of that blue line of treating your best 80% never approaches the cost uh, that you pay for, for uh, uh, replacing all, all your ash trees. And what happens, because you've saved your trees, is that your blue line, your forest, is a lot larger because you've protected a lot of the trees. So basically, you get a lot more trees for the same amount of money. All right, so it seems to be a bit of a no-brainer. Now, one of the things which is really critical to making this work is you have to use the right information to get the right bid. Uh, last, for the last couple of months, we've been contacting cities that have been uh, treating their trees, and we've been trying to find out how much they're paying per inch.
And this graph over here shows you the actual cost per inch versus the number of trees per bid. And what we see on the left hand side is the cost, like say, goes from zero to $14 per inch DBH. And uh, the number of trees per bid goes all the way up to 10,000. The one on the right, the 10,000 bid, that's Chicago, okay? That's about four bucks an inch, okay? The lower one uh, at about 1,000, that's Fort Wayne. So basically, when you get more than 200 trees per bid, your cost is somewhere between four and five dollars per inch. But if you're less than 200 trees per bid, your costs are anywhere from four dollars all the way up to you know uh, 12 or 13 dollars. So it really pays to work and get these group bids. And 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 when you do that, then then, then it may, makes more sense because uh, if you if you don't, you know, if you use a uh, this was this these this estimates over here were it's basically the same data the blue line now uh, you see these larger spikes on these blue lines over here which is the treatment lines they're much more expensive because this was using uh, ten dollars per inch okay uh, rather than that uh, bulk rate of four dollars and uh, thirty five cents so it's it's it, it, it's really important um, Chicago uh, is really satisfied with what's going on they use they say at least in, in on their PR pages, if you can believe them, what they say, it, it, uh, I'm sure it, it, it's pretty accurate. They say it costs them $40 to treat a tree versus $1,000 to remove and replacement, and they have a 93% successful treatment rates. Naperville's doing the same kind of a thing. So more and more cities are really starting to catch on with this thing, and really uh, treatment has become much more of a viable role. So you know, there's lots of evidence to, to suggest that you should uh, jump in on this. Uh, it's important to save trees because trees are are valuable. Uh, if you haven't yet to go on to treebenefits.com uh, calculator, uh, I would I would suggest that you do that. You put in your zip code, you put in your tree, and it tells you how much value. Uh, as a rule of thumb, a hundred inch tr a ten inch ash tree provides a hundred dollars in benefits per year. Okay, now. Uh, there was a webinar uh, that was done uh, in November of 2013 by Randy Krauss of Milwaukee, and he shows how he used iTree as well as um, uh, to uh, iTree and, and his inventory to justify treating all his ash tree. Basically, he found that the stormwater costs associated with losing the ash trees, okay, because each 18-inch ash tree uh, will process 2,500 gallons of stormwater. Uh, that that cost would save the the, the stormwater processing water processing costs would save the city enough money to justify treating the trees. It's much cheaper to do that than to uh, build more uh, sewage uh, treatment plants. So uh, this is a great example if you're looking for ways to work with municipal managers to justify uh, a treatment program. Uh, there have been other studies. Uh, we had uh, in March of 2013, we had Jeff Donovan uh, come in and talk about uh, uh, his uh, EAB and public health study. This is that famous study that shows that uh, cities that have lost ash trees uh, have been experiencing more deaths due to cardiovascular disease. So there's some real public health uh, uh, events. And we're not talking about having a heart attack because your tree fell down. Uh, I mean, th there are some, uh, you know, there's particulate matter, air quality, all these different sorts of things uh, that, 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 that contribute to that. So uh, if you want more information about that, feel free to jump in on that, on that uh, webinar on demand. OK, so with all this information that we know right now about the value of trees. Now, why do communities fail to act? Well, you know, there's a delay between the, dete the detection of emerald ash borer and the, de and, and the actual decline. So typically what happens, like uh, in, uh, let's say in 2010, uh, a city finds, that, uh, a county finds that emerald ash borer is in the area. Lots of news play, lots of radio play. Uh, but nothing really starts to happen for about four years. And at four years or so, that's when you might have maybe one in f one in five or one you know one in six of your of your ash trees actually starting to to to, to die, and and then you go from uh, 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 from. 16% to 32, which you have a third of them dying, and then you go to two thirds, and then they're all dead. So it happens really, really fast. So what happens is that people hear about the tree, about the threat of the trees dying, uh, and then by the time they actually start dying, or just before, they start losing interest. And uh, and I think that what happens is that um, people also think that they're going to have to treat forever, 
Uh, and the reality is that they really don't, because after all the trees die, the population, the, the uh, pressure for emerald ash borer declines greatly, and the need for insecticide treatment also declines greatly. And then the third thing, probably which is the biggest Achilles heel, is that what happens is that a city, uh, uh, emerald ash borer comes to a city, somebody's proactive, they call a few arborists, and they say, they, they give them a price of 10 to $15 per inch to treat a tree. And then they plug that number into the calculator, they realize, they see that it doesn't make sense economically to, to do that. Now, now, the reason that arborists charge more money is that arborists do more than just spray insecticides or, or inject insecticides. These people are, are tree doctors. They're trained to evaluate risks, uh, uh, st uh, tree structure, tree health. Um, they uh, know how to prune trees. They do all, all these different sorts of skills. And it costs more money to hire somebody who's able to do that than it does to have somebody whose specialized skill is drilling holes and injecting insecticides. So there are uh, companies that are able to, to do these low bids, have staff that are able to actually uh, provide the service at, the, at, at that lower cost. So uh, I can't stress enough the need to uh, get competitive bids and try to get larger bids for protecting your ash trees. Okay, there, uh, we developed a program uh, at, at Purdue called uh, Neighbors Against Bad Bugs, uh, we, where you act quickly to uh, save trees and save money. And what, what this is, is, is just a, a, a program that tries to improve community awareness at any stage of the Emerald Ash Borer invasion. So if the community is organized, they can work together uh, and uh, 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 save money by uh, these group costs. Now, we developed this uh, very popular guide, Anne-Marie Nagel and I developed this guide called the EAB Decision Guide, uh, where we just basically people tell people that if they don't know what's going on, they should, they should probably talk to an arborist. Uh, and, and it's really only an arborist that can tell whether or not a tree is, is worth saving. And we found this, this is quite, quite popular, and this is available uh, at, our, at, at our website. Okay, uh, other topics that we have that we have uh, discussed uh, have been um, issues uh, like about biological control, and we had Julie Gould in October of 2013. Uh, she talked about biological control. She's one of the authors of the guidelines for uh, um, the uh, recovery and release. And the the take home point of this is that uh, there are. Uh, several parasites that have been removed, that have been released into North America, and they are starting to take hold. Uh, the uh, one on the uh, upper left, Tetrastigus planipensis, uh, is a larval parasite that has established in most of the places that it has been released. And uh, it is uh, there have been several studies uh, done by John Dwan and others that are showing that uh, they are actually having an impact on the population dynamics. In English, it means that they are able to protect uh, the regrowth forest to allow ash trees to get large enough until they reproduce. Uh, that now, how large will the ash will the uh, regrowth forest be in the presence of these uh, natural enemies? Uh, that is sort of an open question at this point in time. Uh, one of the big limitations we have is the length of the ovipositor or the egg laying device uh, that the emerald ash borer has. And um, there are uh, new uh, parasites that are being introduced with larger ovipositors. Right now we know we can protect trees up to four inches in diameter, but with some of these new parasitoids that are being released, uh, we're hopeful that we can protect even even larger trees. So uh, this story is still being played out and you, we will we are certain to have updates about biological control of emerald ash borer in the future. The main point is that we're not saving trees, which we're not sa we're not saving the big trees. I think the, the goal is trying is probably to try and uh, allow the regrowth forest to reestablish and get and produce larger larger trees. So it's not something you're going to do. Uh, you're not going to release parasites into a city to protect your ash trees, but you will release them in a forest so that the regrowth forest will actually uh, remain ash. We've also had some talks about wood utilization. Uh, last uh, last December, uh, we had Brian Brayshaw give a wonderful talk about uh, different ways for uh, using trees that have been killed by invasive species. You know, it's more it's it's more than just a wood miser. Uh, we've got. Um, the uh, wood you know, he developed wrote this book on on, on wood uh, utilization options uh, for uh, infested uh, uh, for, for for trees, and uh, he has lots of tools and strategies for uh, 
getting value out of the trees that have been uh, destroyed uh, due to due to these invasions. And if you're and if you're in a city where you've lost trees due to emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, strongly suggest you get a copy of this and look at our webinar. Um, and we've also had a couple of uh, talks about woodlot management. You know, we're not just talking about uh, cities, although even though I know that's my, my main focus. Uh, we had Lenny Farley uh, talk about uh, approaches, uh, uh, last of all, talking about approaches for evaluating your woodlot and strategies for getting the value that you want in your woodlot, whether it is some combination of wildlife habitat or lumber, uh, there, he has lots of strategies involved for that. We then also had uh, Mark Whitmore from Cornell uh, discuss his approach where they look at multiple communities' uh, needs and community values for uh, 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 protecting uh, the ash resource. And uh, he, he, uh, he, his, his talk is quite interesting because he's worked with a lot of social scientists. And they take a different uh, a different perspective uh, than uh, some of the entomologists and foresters that we've uh, had featured uh, on in the past. So if you want to look at some new perspectives, I would certainly encourage you uh, taking a look at, at uh, Mark's talk on December uh, 18th. Okay, so with that, um, this is my last slide, and I'm ready to, to entertain questions. Uh, but I, I, before I leave, I, I definitely want to say that uh, next week we're going to have a talk of, of Don Egan uh, from uh, uh, Pennsylvania and what, what he's going to be talking about is he is actually uh, sort of on, on the forefront and uh, he is trying to develop statewide uh, uh, management plans for ash and uh, the importance of this is that uh, the Forest Service is considering uh, ways of lending assistance uh, for states that are having problems with emerald ash borer and much of that may in fact hinge on having an effective management plan. So if you're interested in learning about that sort of stuff I strongly urge you to tune in next week. And then finally uh, on uh, April 9th we're going to have Joe LaForest uh, who has developed a series of apps for detecting okay, Cliff, there's invasive one person species we'll just go, uh, including kind of backing up. detecting oh, and reporting just invasive species here. Uh, um, including uh, the Gre emerald ash Gregory board Goodfellow board. says I'm so a bit confused questions. about the slide that said when EAB population pressure declines need for does this mean that we should expect that sure. once EAB has gone through an area, it won't return at a later point to attack remaining ash trees? No, 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 that's a, okay. That's a very good question. So the question is once emerald ash borer moves through, will we still have to contend with emerald ash borer? And the answer is yes. We will always have to contend with emerald ash borer. But what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that after that initial wave goes through, all the ash that have not been treated have been killed. So the population of host plants is so low that the, that the population of beetles is not likely to reach the level it was before because you know pretty much you know you've lost probably 80 percent of your ash in your in, in your community because you know when we talk about protecting ash on street trees and we start talking about uh, protecting ash in private properties you know a lot of the ash you know you find are in streams in, in in wooded areas just on the periphery of these of these urban areas and all those ash are probably going to be killed uh, when the emerald ash borer moved through so that you, so so that the only hosts that are available are the ones that were actually injected with insecticides, and that's going to be a lot a lot fewer than what was there before. So you just won't have that really high population. And the thing is that uh, when an emerald ash borer first attacks a tree, it normally takes about two years to complete its life cycle if the tree is healthy. All right, so that uh, the population is going to build very slowly. And if you start noticing fresh woodpecks. Or you start noticing a little, you know, fresh woodpeck on the top, or you start noticing some fresh splits. That's when you want to make sure that you inject your tree with something like amamectin benzoate, which we know can protect trees that have lost up to half of their canopy. All right, and then if you do it once, you know that's going to knock it back, and and it'll it'll that there'll be enough in so there far. for a couple of um, years. We have, have a have question from for, Chris Medic uh, in Indiana. Maybe wants to years. know um, early on you were talking about blue ash trees, and she says uh, 
because of, they're so susceptible. So are, are okay. susceptible. I'm sorry. So is it unnecessary to treat at blue ash? Is what her question is. Resistant. Good question, Chris. Um, the uh, uh, there have been several studies uh, that have been done uh, looking at blue ash in the forests. All right, and in forests where emerald ash borer and, and, and uh, blue ash and white ash have been, uh, they were uh, over ninety-five percent of the white ash were killed but 70% of the blue ash remained after that initial invasion wave went through. So in a forest, there's no need to protect it. Now, blue ash, uh, what we're finding uh, based on some of the research on the, on, on the resistance is uh, that they act almost like Man Manchurian ash, okay, in that they are, so there was a common garden study that was done by uh, Sarah Tannis and Deb McCulloch, it was published last month in the Journal of Economic Entomology, and one of the things that they, they, they found was that uh, they looked at the number of eggs that were being laid on uh, all these different kinds of ashes, including green ash and white ash and such, and they found that there were upwards of 200 eggs per meter uh, I mean, they, excuse me, upward of 200 eggs per tree that they were looking at on green ash, but only two laid on Manchurian ash and 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 and, and blue ash. Okay, so and, and they think that they they're um, sorry, these weren't eggs. These were the number of larval galleries that they found. So so what they did is they compared the number of larval galleries that were actually on on these trunks. And and so what what happens is that there were very few larvae actually starting on Manchurian ash. And on blue ash, but on green ash, there were like upwards of 200 larvae per square meter. Okay, so the the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that both blue ash and green ash are not preferred when trees are well watered and irrigated. Okay, and they're doing well. However, if a tree is stressed, so if you if you've got blue ash as Am I connected? Good. Okay. So I, I would suggest that just like river birch are are susceptible to to bronze birch borer during a drought, blue ash and street trees uh, that are street trees will be susceptible to emerald ash borer in a drought or just say a high stress situation. So uh, I would say street trees that don't have a decent bed, uh, a, a decent a planting bed that aren't irrigated, they're going to be subject to emerald ash borer and they should probably be treated. But if they're in a park-like setting and there's getting adequate irrig irrigation, you, you, you might be able to get away without doing it. Right. Um, uh, you have a question from Bob Everingham when you were discussing treatment. Um, he wanted to know if the data that you showed uh, on your um, on your slide was for on a per year basis, or was it every other year treatment? Uh, good question. Uh, for the neonicotinoid treatment, the imidacloprid treatment, those were treated every single year. The neonic the, the uh, imidacloprid and the dinotefran were treated every single year. The Amamectin benzoate was treated just one time in 2006, and it lasted through to 2008. Okay, let's see here. We've got more. People really want to use some of your slides, Cliff. I told them they could either look at the recorded webinar or they could email you if they had specific slides that they wanted to. Look okay. At. Uh, all right. Uh, actually, you know, I've got a. Um, okay. They, they could also, yeah, if, if they want to, um, yeah, because if they can use the slides, you know, the, you can, um, there's a, a tool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Send me an email and uh, let me know what you want to use them for and I'll, and I'll share as much as I possibly can, okay? Because some of those slides are not mine to share, but I can certainly get some permissions. I can, I can uh, find out who to contact to get some of these as well because uh, some of these things are, 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 have yet to be published, so I don't want to share somebody else's data. So just let me know what you want and I'll let you know what I can share. 
All right, thank you. Um, Gregory Goodfellow, he thanks you for your answer. He just wants to reiterate and confirm um, that after the initial wave of EAB, it then becomes more of an issue of diligence to look for early warning signs of new EAB infestations and start treating again. Okay, you so know, the need for treatment will just be needed more infrequently. Well, you know, here's so, a nice way to remember it. Okay, uh, try try to think of it as going from nozzle head to IPM mode. Okay, so I'm saying so instead of being spraying uh, proactively, you go to a, an integrated pest management mode where you look for new symptoms and then you treat after you see them. So you're always vigilant. Got it. I have one person that said uh, they, they tuned in late. I'm wondering if citizens, if citizens were to adopt a street tree to pay for treatment, how often does treatment need to be repeated? Uh, oh, I.e., um, what is the cost for small trees, maybe 25-inch DBH? Well, you know, uh, if they're going to do it themselves, if they're going to, you know, it's going to probably, you know, if you if you contract an arborist, uh, an arborist is, is going to charge. Uh, about twelve dollars an inch to treat a tree. So uh, twelve dollars. Okay, let's say if it's ten, it's two fifty. It's about three. It'll be about three hundred dollars to treat that tree. And um, so um, it'll be about three hundred dollars to, to, to treat that tree. And you would treat it uh, every. Uh, you could probably treat it every two to three years, depending on where you are in the cycle. Uh, during the peak, you'd want to treat it every two years, but then afterwards, you know, you could you go less. So, so I, I would. It's so, yeah. So you probably could get away with two to three treatments, but you know, think about that. So if you are, uh, if you spend three treatments, and that's seven hundred and fifty dollars to treat. All right, uh, it's going to be three treatments at three hundred dollars a piece. That would be uh, nine hundred dollars. That's going to be less expensive than it would be to probably remove that tree. And uh, at the end of the cycle, you have a bigger tree, and you don't—you're not stuck there with a small stick. Okay. Um, so, you know, a, a tiny little tree. Bob Everingham says, "What? So the cost data are for every other year." He just. Um. W okay. In in the calculator. I was assuming that they were applying emamectin benzoate every other year during the aggressive maintenance phase, and then during the uh, uh, the aggressive management phase. Then in the uh, after the first eight years, then they would go into a they would apply every four years, okay, and that's a fairly conservative estimate. I think you could probably okay. Go um, Del Frost <laughs> wants to know what size does the fringe tree have to be for the EAB to attack. Well, Dell, it's got to be thicker than your thumb. So, and uh, so, so the thing is that uh, you know, if using what we know in the forest, if it's if it's a half inch thick or greater, the adult female will lay her eggs on it. If it's thinner than that, that they won't. Now, for fringe trees, you know, in the trade, a lot of the fringe trees are show are, are sold as small trees or small shrubs, and they're mul they're, they're small multi trunked trees and it takes a while for them to get to get that big now we know you know so far that what we know is that it's only the um, native fringe tree where we've seen problems in 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 nature okay but the the Asian ones you know uh, that's an area of, of study that you know Don Cipollini is actively working in so I, I really if you want to get all the details on that you know just hear it from the horse's mouth uh, which is uh, which is Don and just uh, open up his webinar There we go. Okay. Um, what was the off, amount of stormwater interception for okay. an 18 inch ash tree? I think you might have mentioned that. Okay. 2,500 2, gallons. All right. And Amy's linked people to the tree calculator website here on the chat pod. So uh, let's. No, 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 no. This is, no, no, this is the. Uh, 
Oh, on the oh, on right, the chip. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the slide um, here is the feedback. Gina yeah. says uh, sorry, for removals, no, um, they have been able to get amazingly low removal costs by competitive bidding. Eleven inch trees, seventy five dollars. Twenty to twenty five yep. inch trees, three fifty each. Eight hundred and fifty for even the largest trees. And Gina, mm -hmm. where where are you again? That's uh, it's kind of be good information right. to know to kind of get an idea. See if I've got some more here. I think I've gotten everyone. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that you know, uh, you know, the uh, working together. I mean, I, I've talked with uh, with uh, Chad Tinkle, and he's able to to do that as well. But you know, if if you want to actually, uh, I've wrestled with this quite a bit, and it, when I'm trying to make the the actual costs. Uh, I, I'm trying to compare. You know, if you are going, if you are actually going for treating your trees and protecting the bulk of your trees, you're not going to get the bulk removal rates. Okay, for uh, the bulk cost for removal. So uh, you're 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 going for. So if you're going to go for bulk removal, then you use bulk removal prices. But if you're going to go for bulk treatment, you go for bulk treatment prices and small. Removal prices. And Gina is in Small Indiana, Lake County, Northwest Indiana and Munster. So yep. there yep. you go. Are, are there any other questions? Yep. Um, we've had some good feedback here and we've had some good uh, It's been really great. I'm, I'm yeah, glad great. everyone's getting something out of this. This has really been helpful for us too to see what's uh, kind of get a synopsis of all the uh, types of information you can yeah. get on EAB University and the recorded webinars too so yeah yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and the, these surveys are so important for us to feed to, for you to fill out because the, that information helps us maintain our funding all right lee greenwood is here from the don't move firewood so, um website and that in that whole um, effort so if you have any yes. questions for her you can type some in yep yeah so uh did we uh did you make the announcement oh yes the survey is on survey yet is or, no, I'm, robin oh yes the survey is on yeah Right there, yeah. so if so folks the, need to, we'd really appreciate it if you would yeah. click on that uh, URL there and give us your feedback and the tell us where you're from and the whole good nine yard that you could. Yeah, the first ten respondents get a get a goodie bag. That's with, right, with undisclosed goodies. EAB goodie bag. 